Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Last time, we explored the periodic table in its entirety. Well, almost its entirety. We talked about many patterns. We talked about the fact that as you go down, you add a new shell. As you go over, you add more electrons. And we talked about the families and how they had similar properties. And there's one thing about the periodic table that we didn't talk about, and we're going to do that now. And that thing has to do with valence shells. You may remember, let's take a simple one. Uh, let's do hydrogen. You may remember that we talked about the fact that the outermost shell is the valence shell, right? So here's hydrogen, very simple. And then we talked about way on the other side of the periodic table, right? On the opposite side from hydrogen, if we pull out our table here. So we've got ourselves hydrogen here. And way on the opposite side, we have helium. And we talked about how this first shell can hold a maximum of two electrons. Why only two? Um, that's a little complicated, but it's only two. And we talked about the fact that hydrogen and helium, they behave differently, right? The hydrogen is the first of the alkali metal families. Helium is the first of the noble gases, and each one of them has a certain way that it behaves. But here's the weird thing, right? Here's the part that we didn't explore. Atoms do not just sit around doing nothing, right? In grade nine, you learned about the atoms, you learned how they were made, you learned how they were built, and you learned that they exist and that they were different from each other. But they're not only different in that each one of them, you know, looks different, has different composition, different pieces making it up, but they're also different because they want different things. Take our hydrogen, for example. We know that just a little ways away on the periodic table is helium. And helium has a full shell. And hydrogen really wants a full shell. All elements want a full shell. Because a full valence shell, it's, um, it's comfortable for them, right? It's like they've got a nice place, some good food, nice bed, a nice couch they can relax on, some games to play. They're doing well in life. And that is what hydrogen wants. Hydrogen wants to add one more electron to finish its outer valence. And when it does that, we give it a name. We say that this becomes an ion. This is to make it distinguishable or different from hydrogen that doesn't have anything of the sort. That's an atom. This is incredibly important for chemistry. Pretty much all chemistry, all of it, yeah, even, even you, exists because of this tendency for the atoms to try and fill their shell. Now, we need to sort of be able to define some of these things. We need to be able to explore some of these things. So the first thing is, let's get a definition for an ion. An ion is a non-neutral atom. Non-neutral in this case is a little bit broad. It means the atom is either going to be positive or it's going to be negative. Either one, doesn't matter which one. The difference between positive and negative, that's called a binary choice. A binary choice just means two. Bi means two, and nary, hmm, actually I'm not sure what the etymology of that part of the word is, but a binary choice means that there are two different options. And the thing about binary choices is, is that they tend to be opposite, right? Like left and right, up and down. So if you know one, you know the other. I think we talked about this just the other time. So an ion is a non-neutral atom that can be either positive or negative. And one of the things to understand about this, right, is that um, these guys can combine. This ionic nature results in what we call bonding. Bonding is the reason why you or I or anything in the entire universe exists, because bonding allows for different atoms to come together to make more complicated things. Because otherwise, you just have like a gas of hydrogen just floating in space, doing nothing. Uh, maybe being a star, but that's pretty cool. Well, it's very not cool. But either way, bonding 
is what happens when you combine two or more elements to form a compound. All right? So bonding is another big definition for us, is when we combine two or more elements into a compound. Now, a compound is just a fancy science way of saying a bigger, more complicated thing, right? So you are made of compounds because you are not simple by any stretch of the imagination. You are made of multitude of complicated and interlocking pieces. So you would be a compound. Now, there are two big styles of compound that we're going to be investigating. The two big styles, we'll do them in colors here, sure. We'll say one of them is going to be ionic. And the other one is covalent. We're going to study one, then we're going to study the other. Now, I think you can probably tell that ionic bonding, ionic bonding is related to ions because it's, it's got ion in the name. Covalent does not relate to ions, but we'll talk about that later on. Now, since right now we're talking about ions, we're going to go into ionic bonding in a little more detail, right? So ionic bonding <clears throat> is the electrical attraction, sort of like static electricity, right? Positive, negative, like the two sides of a magnet. It's not exactly the same, but it's the same idea. It is about the static attraction Let's say the static electric attraction of two ions. Specifically, a positive ion and a negative ion. These positives and negatives, they get special names because positive and negative is too easy. Chemists like to make things complicated now and then. Positive ones are called cations, and negative ones are called anions. I have heard this particular word pronounced cation, especially by those with a French background, but it is pronounced cation, which is helpful because it means that we can more easily remember which one is which because there is, of course, a chemistry joke around cations. Now, I must preface, chemistry jokes are not funny, so you're not allowed to laugh. Chemistry joke's purpose is to tell you if you've studied enough. If you have, I will say the joke and you'll go, uh, that was bad. And if you haven't studied enough, I'll say the joke and you'll go, I don't get it. So here we go. With that preamble out of the way, cations have positive charge. Yup, that is about as funny as chemistry gets. You have been warned. Cations are positive. Okay, so let's recap. Atoms, huh, like these guys here, have empty gaps in their in their valence shell and they want to fill them when they do they become ions now this hydrogen has got an extra electron and as a result of that it becomes negative this is always so strange for students if i add an electron i become more negative now the reason for this if we take a look at it right is that normally hydrogen has one proton right that's the definition of hydrogen, and I'm going to add to it two electrons. Normally, it only has one, but this time it has two because it's an ion. Now, the electrons, of course, are negative, and the protons are positive. So when I put those two together, 
overall, this particular one would be a negative one charge. There can be situations where the charge instead is positive one, for example, but for the purposes of this starting example, here we go with a nice negative one. Now, as we're going to see, chemists need to make things difficult on a regular basis, so rather than just write this as negative one like that, they would probably write it like this. Makes it a little simpler. They don't have to write the one part. It's just assume that you know that it's got a negative of some form. The other thing they might do, though, just to be weird, is they might write it like this. Why they put the one, the negative sign behind the one? No idea. They just decided it was a good idea and they ran with it. Okay. So, all right, that's a starting example. Let's take a look at another one just to see if we can't get the hang of this. So, we're going to start with the atom of some kind, and then we're going to turn it into an ion. Now, this particular ion is going to be a little bit trickier. It's going to be a little different. Right? It's going to be a little bit of a change from the one we just saw. We're going to be starting with good old sodium. Now, we need to know what sodium is, so we get out our periodic table, and we try to find sodium, and here it is, right next to my finger. So that is in the one, two, three, the third row, third period in the periodic table name. The third period, which means that it will be, hmm, three shells. Okay. So we need to put three shells on this guy. One, two, three. Now, what else do we know? Well, it's in the first family, which means that its valence shell should only have one electron. So, all right, that's pretty easy. We have one electron here. Boom. Now, we still need to fill in the rest. Now, it says here that um, sodium has an atomic number of 11. So we need 11. In total, we need 10 more. Well, we know how many the interior shells can hold, right? It's two for the inner shell. And then the next shell out can hold eight, which they will be paired, remember, There we go. So there is our atom of sodium because it has a balanced charge, right? The charge on this thing is zero. Why is it zero? Well, once again, if we do a little bit of math, we know that we have 11 protons. So that'd be plus 11. And we know that we have 11 electrons, which is minus 11. And of course, 11 and 11 is zero. All right, so far, not too bad. But what else? Well, now we're going to turn this into an ion. Now, we've got two options for ions, right? We can either go with our cation or our anion. We can go positive or we can go negative. Now, how do we do that? Well, we get negative by adding electrons, and we become positive by removing them. So first things first, let's draw ourselves another sodium just so we can have an ion to work with, so we can compare the two side by side. And what you're going to see here, and we'll put one down here like so. Okay, we all got dotted lines. And what you're going to see here is that there are two options, okay? So option one, just like with the hydrogen example that we already did, is that we could make this guy negative, right? And in order to make it negative, well, we have to remember the rule here. Ions want a full shell. Full. That's the key. Full valence shell. Hmm. Full. Okay, well, that means we need to know how many electrons can shell number three hold. Now, remember, we can find that on our periodic table. If we pull out the periodic table and we look at row three, we will see that there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight elements across, which means that this shell can hold a maximum of eight. So I can put eight electrons in here like this. And that would be full, right? I have added a whole bunch of electrons and it has become full. But there's another trick to this. And this is where things get a little sneaky. 
Because I just said that I'm going to go from here, sodium, all the way over here to the end, which is argon, right? I basically took eight steps, because every time I take a step, I add one more electron. So I went from here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But remember, last video, I showed you the fact that the periodic table is actually a circle or a cylinder with the two sides lining up. I just went eight steps forward. I only need to have a full valence. What happens if I go one step backward? Hmm. What that look like? If I go one step backward, I start with my atom, just like before, but now I'm going to lose one electron. I'm going to take it away. So if I take this guy away, well, the shell is empty, so we don't have to draw it anymore. So I just am going to erase like so. And there we go. I now have a full valence shell. Rather than adding a bunch of new ones, I just took away one. And really, if you had a choice between, you know, having to go fetch seven pails of water from down by the river, pretty heavy, or you wanted to just drop off one extra bucket on the floor next to your bed, which one sounds like a better option? I know, a weird analogy. I don't know where I came from, up with it from. Losing one is way easier than gaining seven. So what does that mean? This is the option that the sodium is going to go for. The elements will always be lazy, just like students. So in this particular case, this sodium still has plus 11 protons, but now it only has 10 electrons. So when I do the bit of math here, I'm going to get that this whole thing is plus 1. So if I want to write that, I would say that this is the ion Na1+, plus, or if I was being a little bit more lazy, just Na+. Plus. This, being positive, would be an example of a cation. Oh, look, cation and anion have the word ion right in them to try and remind you what you're doing. Convenient. So this is the broad idea of ions. We've seen an anion, the hydrogen example that I worked with, where we added an electron. And now we've seen a cation, where I've removed an electron to reveal the inside shell that is already full. The reason for that is entirely because, as mentioned, the periodic table is not flat. It is round. So I can go from here across this way, sure. But much easier to go from here back one step to the row before. Now, again, that looks really weird when it's flat like this. But if I take it and rotate it around to line everything up, I can very clearly see that 10 and 11 are right next to each other. So I just go from number 11 back one space to number 10. So, again, the periodic table is telling you the answers. We can write this down. We can simplify this. We can record this for our own use. Flip back in your notes to your periodic table where you were recording a bunch of information. Let's take a look at what we can do, right? So we ended up filling out tons of information. We showed all about the different kinds of families, and we showed the patterns in the rows and the columns and all the rest. But we're going to take it one step further because there is a pattern in the table to the ions. If I've got my periodic table, okay, I'll do a quick sketch of one. That'll do. If I do a quick sketch of a periodic table, right, we remember we've got the, the eight families right here. So here we got number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, six, seven, eight. The eight families, which you know, we can name them as well. Ah, no, we did it last time. Let's not waste any more time. 
we have our eight families. And of course, there is the heads of each of those families. We've got hydrogen, we've got beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and helium. And let's map out what we've already kind of explored. Sodium is over here, and we saw that it was much easier for this guy here to go back one space than to go forward seven spaces. Similar, if I've got a guy over here, well, it's probably going to be a lot easier for me to go forward one space than to go back seven spaces. In a lot of ways, the eighth column here represents a finish line. A finish line of sorts for the different elements. They want a full valence, and every element in this row has a full valence. Once an atom gains enough electrons or loses enough electrons to reveal a full valence, they get to kind of hang out and pretend they're a noble gas. So what we're going to see is, is that this family here is one step removed from the finish line. And remember, this family is very reactive. So one step removed, very reactive. Two steps removed, less reactive, but still pretty strong. Three steps removed, less reactive still, but still on the, on the race. So what we're going to see is, is that this one here is going to become 1 minus, 2 minus, and 3 minus. Now they're minuses because all of them are trying to gain electrons, right? They're trying to go this way across the chart. And as we said, if you go this way, you gain electrons. And as I gain electrons, I become more negative. That's always the weirdest part. Now we're going to come back to number four because number four is in a weird place. Now we're going to come way on the other side of the table. And what we saw was, was that the sodium that was right here lost one electron to get to the end of the race, right? It went backwards through the racetrack rather than forwards. So what's going to happen there? This one here is going to become 1 plus, this is 2 plus, and this is 3 plus. And again, that actually fits the pattern we saw. We said that this was the most reactive metal. This was the second most reactive of the metals. This was the third most reactive of the metals. Hmm, but that leaves carbon. What did we say about carbon? Check the carbon family. What do you see there? What does it mention? If I do a real quick carbon here, what do we get? Well, remember, every atom wants a full valence, right? They all want to get to the end of the race. But look at carbon's position. Look at what it's got here. I've got four electrons in the valence. Well, that means I could add four electrons, right? I could take my red marker here and go, all right, I'm going to add a couple more electrons, and that would be full. And if I did that, this would be carbon four minus. But what else could I do? Well, I could add four, but I could take four away. If I start off again with my neutral atom, like so, instead of putting four on, I could take four off. That's a lot to take away, but it's exactly the same as putting them on, right? And then once I do that, I can remove the extra shell. I don't need to show it because there's nothing in it. And there we go. I reveal a full valence shell underneath. If I do that, I'm going to get C4+. plus Because I've lost four electrons, I'm four more positive than I was before. Now, if you think about the pattern we saw in the periodic table, we mentioned that carbon family is the most flexible. That's pretty flexible, isn't it? They're located in the middle of the table, which means they can go either left or right and still get to the end of the race. Boron and lower has to go this way. Nitrogen and bigger has to go this way. Carbon gets to choose. At least in theory.
Um, we're going to see carbon continues to be very flexible and strange. And I will remind you that there were two types of bonding that we talked about, ionic and covalent. Carbon mostly deals with covalent bonding, but we've already done enough today. Now, one thing that I'm sure you've noticed is that right now, drawing all of these Bohr diagrams is a lot of work. A whole lot of work. Now, there was a chemist a long time ago who realized the same thing, and they realized they didn't want to have to draw Bohr diagrams because while Bohr was a nice guy and all, his work was tedious. So, he introduced his own style of drawing chemical elements. It's pretty useful, too, so we keep using it. It's called the Lewis structure. The Lewis structure is about drawing just the valence electrons. Otherwise, it's exactly the same. So, for example, hydrogen. We'll start with a simple one. Hydrogen has one electron. There it is. Helium would have two. One, two. And he just uses dots. To be honest, dots are pretty common for Bohr diagrams as well, so no big surprise there. Lithium. Now, lithium, of course, has three electrons, right? Because if I pull out my periodic table and I take a look here and I go, oh my, lithium's right there. That has three electrons. So do I have to draw three? No, because Lewis, very clever man, said, no, we only, the part we care about is the valence because that's the part where all the chemistry happens, right? The inner shell, it's basically stuck. It's locked in place, right? It's, it's finalized. But the outer shell can change. So lithium just has one electron on the valence. Beryllium only has two. What about oxygen? Well, oxygen, of course, has, it's in the sixth family. It's two steps away from the end, and the end is eight. So it's going to have six electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six. Just like that. Fluorine. It is one step away, so it has seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And there we go. Now, what happens if I wanted to make these ions? That's pretty easy, isn't it? Just add a couple dots. I used a different color to make it easy to distinguish. These guys are a little bit tricky, because how do you show removing an electron? Usually what you do is you just erase them, and then you put in the charge. You could put it as 1 plus, or you could just put it as plus. Helium, would it do anything? No. Noble gas, it stays the same, doesn't have to do anything. It is comfortable, it is happy the way it is. Hydrogen, as mentioned, it's a bit of a weird one. Usually it it could gain one and become a minus, but it could also lose one and become a plus. Both are options. And to be honest, we're not really going to look into hydrogen too much. So we'll leave it off. Hydrogen comes up more with covalent bonding. Anyway, that's about it. We've done an awful lot. I'd like you guys to do some practice to give it a try. And of course, if you're getting stuck, ask questions. You're going to find that these Lewis structures are very useful for the next thing, which is where we start talking about ionic bonding in more detail. And we're going to start putting atoms together in order to make compounds. But before we can do that, you need to make sure to practice on how to make ions themselves. Right? Can you identify ions? Is this one a cation or an anion? Does it have pause? Is it positive? No, it's negative, so this must be an anion, similar with the fluorine. You need to be able to identify them, you need to be able to work with them, you need to be able to figure out the numbers, and then, then we'll make some compounds. That's enough for now. I'll see you guys next time.